Let's say you wanted to make something that was of adjustable length very accurately in tiny increments. One way to make something adjustable is to use teeth, but for small adjustments, the teeth would have to be really tiny and that's impractical. Is there a better way to do it? Absolutely. Rather than making one adjustment with tiny teeth, what if you made two changes with bigger teeth and leveraged the difference between them to get your desired results? Here, let me show you. Let's say you wanted to make an adjustable little blocky thing that can change length by a small amount and very accurately, let's say 10 thousandths of an inch. For my metric friends, that's 127 five hundredths millimeter. We'll use the magic of differential indexing and use two slightly different sets of teeth to get these results. So one side of this block has teeth which move in 100 thousandths increments. On the other side, we'll make teeth that are 110 thousandths. They look very similar, but they're just a tiny bit different, just 10 thousandths of an inch. If we make a base measurement that is two inches long and then move the 100 thousandths side shorter and move the other 110 thousandths side longer, the net measurement is 10 thousandths longer than when we started. And look, we did it with a tooth size that is easy to manufacture. And if we put two of these little blocky things side by side, one with the original two inch setting and another with the two adjustments that we made, you can see the net result as the prophecy in elementary mathematics foretold is the expected tiny but precise difference of 10 thousandths of an inch. Cool, huh? And if you compare these with that block from the opening shot, those were tiny teeth that were 10 thousandths of an inch. And even though it's hard to see here because it's almost microscopic, yes, it shows that we were able to easily, accurately, and repeatedly adjust that tiny amount with two sets of teeth. Let's see it again with another example. Start with two inches. Move the 100 thousandths side backwards. Oh, say twice, so minus 200 thousandths. Then move the 110 thousandths side forward three times. Now the net adjustment is plus 130 thousandths. In metric, that's about 19 fiftieths of a Nutella jar. Now pay attention because this is on the quiz later. I know the kinematic joint fans are having kittens over how overconstrained this is given all the teeth in contact, but there is one distinct advantage. When made out of a material that can stretch very slightly, you can get an effect called elastic averaging where the tiny errors in the teeth are averaged out and you, in theory, get a more precise result. Also with use, the wear on the teeth will again tend to average out and become more accurate with time with very good repeatability. So for this example, we basically made adjustable gauge blocks, which might be the worst idea since caramel coated calipers. But let's move on to more interesting examples of differential indexing and show some more practical examples. Longtime viewers of the channel may remember a few years ago when I made a part for the Marble Machine X. The hows and whys I made this are actually really interesting and I'll leave links in the description, but the important part is that Martin needed a device to change the angular relationship between a shaft and a gear so it could rotate and change the relative timing of his machine. I made what we called the indexable clutch, which when a spring-loaded collar was slid backwards, allowed a spline part to rotate freely relative to the shaft but be locked into one of 60 positions. When the collar slid back in place, the part was again locked to the shaft. Those 60 positions allowed for six degree increments, but could we do better? You bet. What if instead of 60 divisions on one side of the part, we had two sides with 40 and 45 divisions? Our new device, minus fasteners and springs for clarity, or at least that's what I tell myself, has a shaft which is keyed. Onto that shaft and key, we place the first part which fits into the key and has 40 splines in it. It also has a little pointer that always points north. No, I'm just kidding. You'll see why soon. Then on that first part, we place a collar which slides onto the splines. Note that both of these pieces are now fixed in place to the shaft. Then we place another piece on the shaft which can turn freely, at least until the collar from the bottom part slides up and locks it in place. So this part that can rotate has 40 splines on the bottom and on the top we have 45. We'll call this the middle piece. Onto that top 45 side, we'll have another locking collar and then the top piece. Right now, the collar's in the locked position so the top piece is fixed to the middle one. Note that the top piece has a little pointer too. Okay, with it assembled, let's do an example that advances only a single degree. I'll include a top-down orthographic view of those little pointers so you can see how they rotate relative to each other. Since the bottom collar is unlocked, we can rotate everything above it one increment of those 40 splines. 
360 degrees divided by 40 means we moved it 9 degrees. Now let's move the collar up and lock it in place. Then let's unlock the top piece and rotate it backwards one spline of those 45, which relative to the shaft is minus 8 degrees. So yay! With a small modification to my original design, we can advance the top piece relative to the bottom one one degree increments any amount we want. You can always do the forward and back in equal amounts to advance however many degrees, but it doesn't have to be in equal amounts. For example, if you want to advance 10 degrees, you could advance the 40 side twice, so 2 times 9 for 18 degrees, then the 45 side back once for minus 8 degrees or 10 in total. Cool, huh? But then I got really interested in what the minimum number of movements would be to get every single degree in a circle. I asked the caramel, but that didn't work. So I argued with the robot, and after some back and forth, I got it to write me some code that I think is fairly compact, and after some spot checks, seems to really work. Now, I'm not really a math guy, but if some of you want to take a crack at it, I'll put a link to the Git repo, and let's figure out this fairly pointless, but very interesting exercise. To give you an appreciation for what we're about to talk about, let's imagine a really big circle. I'm putting a clock at the center, because why not? Then, as we zoom out, let's imagine two walls that represent one degree of that circle. Now, it's a really big circle with a radius of two and a half miles, or about four kilometers. And as we zoom out, the walls that represent that one degree are, of course, getting further and further apart. So far in this video, I've been sneakily prepping you for what's about to come because it's really neat, so hang on for just a little bit more. Now, there are many ways to divide a circle, but one of them is to divide a degree into 60 arc minutes. And as we finally arrive at the end of that two and a half mile radius, we can pan up and see those 60 minutes. To give you an idea of scale, at that two and a half mile circle radius, a degree is about 230 feet, or about 70 meters of arc. If we zoom in and look at one of those minutes, it's about three feet, nine inches of arc, or 1.1 meters, which is about the length of an electric guitar or a frighteningly large chicken. But that's not what's interesting. If we zoom over to the left and we look more closely at one minute of arc, we can further divide that again 60 times into arc seconds. Now an arc second is really small at this long distance, about the diameter of a US dime coin, or in metric, a little smaller than a wine cork. So if you wanted to make a simple device that could divide a circle accurately in the order of seconds, how the heck are you gonna do that? Well, in 1972, someone filed a brilliant patent that does exactly that. To appreciate how clever this is, let's quickly review the two methods we've looked at so far. In the first example on length, we had two sides that were 10 thousandths difference in length, but you could make that difference just one thousandth of an inch or a micron or whatever you want. I'm not your mom. When we looked at the circular example, we picked 40 and 45 divisions because they divided evenly into 360 degrees and have a difference of one degree, so we can use that differential indexing to get any whole degree difference we want. But when you start dividing down to minutes and seconds, you can't possibly make teeth that small. Even worse, when you try to make tiny differences, you quickly notice that nothing divides evenly into a circle and your teeth are going to clash. So the problem was finally cracked by a guy named R.J. Newbold, and he made a famous indexing device that does what seems impossible. There's an incredible thread on Practical Machinist from some years ago where he details how he figured this out, and I'll link to that in the description. And you know what's cool? I have one, and a very early one at that. It's a bit rough, but I love it. Now that you're a slightly changed person and maybe have learned something new, let's do something that seems astonishing. The indexer rotates this little platform around the center in very precise and tiny amounts. It's currently at zero, but let's index an unusual angle, say 20 degrees, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds. These disks are stacked, and on the rear one, I'm going to do 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then on the second dial, I'm going to index it to 20 minutes. And then on the outside dial, I'm going to index it to 20 degrees. And just like that, really simply, quickly, and of course very cheaply, we were able to dial in a really precise and accurate amount, 20 degrees, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds of arc. I hope you appreciate how incredible that is and how hard it would be to do that any other way purely mechanically. To start to understand how the magic works, let's look at the back of the outermost disc, which can move every two degrees. We have what looks sort of like little gear teeth. In fact, RJ called these face gears. And when we look at the back of the first one, we see 180 teeth all the way around. So as you should expect, two degrees per tooth. So when it's stacked on the next disc, we know we can move this first one any two degrees relative to it. 
Note also because of the shape of these face gears, it means that when the nut is tightened at the back, it suddenly pulls everything into a really precise location automatically. And speaking of those discs, you'll notice that they're made of plastic. One way to use these is in a grinding environment to grind really precise angles. That makes a lot of dust and the plastic can conform around tiny particles of grinding dust, keeping the indexer accurate in a way that metal wouldn't. To keep the teeth clean, in a box made by RJ's dad in his garage. It even shipped with a 1970s toothbrush to keep the face gears clean. Okay, now I've set it back to zero. To explain how it works, let's do a single tiny amount and break it down. I'm still holding the cool parts from you a little bit longer, but we'll get to those soon. So let's do something simple like just 10 minutes of arc. It's a really tiny amount, so small we could never make face gears that size, but we can still index it that amount. I'm going to loosen the nut in the back and set the middle disc to just 10 minutes. But look what's happened. The outside 2 degree disc came along with it because again these discs are stacked, which means I have to differentially set the front one back to zero. So I've set it to zero on the 2 degree disc on the outside, 10 minutes on the middle disc, and none on the final disc which is in 30 seconds. And BAM! Just 10 minutes of arc. So small that I have no way to measure it, so you're just going to have to trust me. Now, the clever ones are going to realize that the face gears on the 10 minute disc are not 10 minutes, but 2 degrees 10 minutes. So we added 2 degrees 10 minutes on the minutes disc and then differentially subtracted 2 degrees on the front disc, leaving us with just those tiny 10 minutes. Now the really clever one should have a look of horror on their face because it's sinking in that you can't evenly divide 2 degrees 10 minute sized face gears evenly into 360 degrees. And they're right. And this is where everyone that came before failed, but RJ had a brainwave that got him the patent and why the Smithsonian had an exhibit on this device and why it now sits in their permanent collection. Before I do the big reveal, let's look quickly again at the dials. The outside disc indexes every two degrees, enumerated every four, all the way around. And when we looked at the back, we saw those 180 face gears like we would expect. The middle disc has 10 minute markings up to two degrees. That means that the middle disc can split each of the two degrees on the front disc down to every 10 minutes. And if we look at that third disc, we see that it's enumerated every 30 seconds. That means we can split the 10 minutes of the disc before it down to any minute and then any half minute. We know that 30 seconds is really small at two and a half miles or four kilometers or half of a frightening large chicken. So on this tiny platform, that's a tiny, tiny bit of arc length. Half of the brainwave that RJ had was understanding that because these second and third discs basically just split up the one before it, it doesn't have to go all the way around like the one in front. And if we finally open it up, we start to see the really clever bits here and you'll see what I mean. We already looked at the first disc and those 182 degree teeth. But when we look at the back of the second disc, that's where things start to get really interesting. Remember, we said that these face gears are 2 degrees 10 minutes, which don't divide evenly into 360. So what happens? Well, there's this tiny little spacer where the teeth would collide. Well, what does that mean where they mate on the other disc? If we look at that one, we see there's a gap in the face gears. And that's what RJ realized. He realized to divide two degrees, you only ever need to move that second disc a relatively small amount, and he could leave a gap where that spacer was going to be. And that means that these little teeth can be two degrees, 10 minutes, and it's perfectly fine. There's no problem at all with that. And that's what got him the patent. And that's where a little mental leap that he had proved successful where many others had failed before him, was that he realized he didn't have to divide these evenly by 360 degrees. And if we look at the back of the minutes disc, we see the same thing. The teeth go around until there's a spacer. And then on the frame of the device, there's some face gears and there's a gap in those as well. I know once you see this now, it seems obvious in retrospect what a simple device this could be to divide an arc in such tiny amounts. But this is an idea that eluded even RJ for a long time as he worked through trying to figure this out. And so it's not something that is immediately obvious if you don't know what the answer is. So now you know the secrets of the Newbold Indexer and how it works, but we're not done. Oh no, we have unfinished business. But first the quiz. Being made of plastic, in addition to being compliant to small amounts of dust, 
the face gears can move in very tiny ways which helps average out errors and make this device more accurate. This is called A. Subscribe, B. Kittens, C. Elastic Averaging, D. Unsure, but now I kind of want to brush my teeth with that toothbrush. Answers in the comments, please. Whew. All right. Can't believe I'm about to do this. Mmm, gooey. No, I'm just kidding. I couldn't do anything like that. <coughs> the answer to the quiz, of course, is D, unsure, but I kind of want to use that toothbrush now. Which brings us to my bathroom, where I can hold my new toothbrush at the perfect angle. 28 degrees, 34 minutes, and 30 seconds. <coughs> oh, gritty. Well, now you know a little bit more about differential mechanisms, but there's more of that story to tell. Did you learn something new? Drop a comment. Let me know. I want to thank you, my viewers, for your support, but especially my patrons, who really helped keep things going. Please drop a comment and thank them too for keeping interruptions out of this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.